The Knowledge by Mark Jackson. The Knowledge, a little can be deadly. London, 1971, a cabbie stumbles upon the existence of a secret society with the ranks of a black cab. The Knowledge could kill him. Tony Pinner knows London like the back of his hand, but if he is to discover who his enemies really are, Pinner will need all his knowledge. It might just keep him alive long enough to find out the truth. Approaching the city, Pinner spotted a fair, a businessman, and turned the wheel to cut across the traffic. The city, the square mile, was always full of fares, by day at least. Mainly short hops, meeting to lunch, lunch to meetings. Pinner pushed aside his half-eaten Caramac bar and drew up at the flagged fair. Where to, sir? Clark and well close, okay? It was okay with Pinner. A short hop. The fair was either unfamiliar with the London streets and ways, or running late. Pinner's cab was older than most of those now working the streets. A distant relic, but a well-maintained and with an air of romance. It was a rarity. Comfortably worn brown leather seats and a sparse functional dashboard in a driver's cockpit. The distinctive and distinguished Austin FX3. Hello and welcome on this lovely sunny London day, as you can see. I'm here with Mark Jackson to talk about his recently published book called The Knowledge. So we're going to go inside the shelter because he wants to see inside the shelter and we're going to show him what it looks like to be a real cab driver inside the shelter and we're going to have a chat about the book. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about your background, what you did before writing books and things like that? I've had lots of different jobs. I've worked in restaurants and hospitality for a while. I was a, very briefly a bingo caller, and uh, for quite a long time I was a, a journalist, a newspaper journalist. Right. So, what was the inspiration to writing the book? What, what, what sort of brought it about? What, what made you decide to do it? Um, I was working in, in restaurants, and I got a promotion. And it meant I had enough money to get, have tips to get home late at night. And I started catching cabs and I'd chat away to cabbies. And it began to kind of come to me that, first of all, they're an integral part of London. And um, I seemed to know so much. I mean, out with the, the knowledge they knew and the roots, they knew so much about the history and little quirks. And it came really from the fact that I thought, well, they must be party to so much that people say in the back of cabs, because often they People would forget that there's another person there. People get in from a meeting and they're saying, oh yeah, that was a good meeting. He wasn't he? difficult that time. They're clocking all this, they've got it. But there's a you know a kind of proper code of confidentiality. But that's some other people's information and secrets. And now I began to think, what if there are other bigger secrets? And what if a cabbie stumbles across this secret and it just turns his world upside down? So the book, obviously the knowledge, you start it in sort of the 1600s and um, describing sort of um, the, the Waterman and Lightman on the River Thames and then you move on to 1971 when your main character takes prevalence in the book. Do you want to just explain a little bit, give people a little bit of a taster as to what the, the storyline is about? Well I think... Don't give too much away. No, no, the, 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 part, part of the thing was that I wanted to convey what an integral part of London it is and how long the links with um, the cabbies and the serving of the city have been, and also the main character comes from that environment. You know, his, his family are all connected with cabs, his father, his grandfather, and therefore when he stumbles across the what's going on, it's far more of a shock to him than if he, if he was new yeah. to it, because he's he's taken it, it's nurtured him, and then suddenly it all flips and his, his world really, and suddenly he's under a lot of pressure, right. and he's on his own. And armed with just you know, his, his experience of a cabbie, he has to sort it out. Yeah. And, and the characters are quite unique because you've named them after places in London as well. 
Yeah, I. I what made you do that? Because you, you, when we was talking before, you explained me something about um, a book by somebody else that's taken the same sort of thing. But you knew nothing about. No, it. I didn't. You did it. No. Um, what happened was is that I'd gone to visit some relatives, and they were. I was at a. a court, I was about to go and something to my grandparents, I think, or my aunt and uncle. And I'd taken the train out from London to the Sticks, and this railway guy was putting up all these posters. And it was put, and I had whole rolls of them. And one was the South East Network, but the other one was the tube. And I just asked him, Can I have a couple? And he said, There you go. So I had this tube map in my flat, and I kept looking at it, and I'm thinking, I don't really need to look for any names or London names that fit in London because they're all here. And then it was a case of matching the name to the character. So hence you get, you know, Tony Pinner, you then get Toby Kensel. And then some of them I didn't use necessarily the surname. Just the place name as a surname. It might have been like Olympia as the first name. Rather than it that way broke up a bit better. Um, and as you say, then I, I discovered that other, other writers have done similar things. And I guess it does give the book a sense of place. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Um, one of the things I like, I mean, as I said, I haven't completely read the book yet. I've skimmed through it. One of the things I really liked, and this is a really little, a silly little thing, was the taxis in the middle of the paragraphs. What made you decide to do that? Oh, that was a discussion with the publisher. And um, the, the kind of book designer said, oh, I think I can make this even more a sense of it being a book about cabbies. And so sent me that little icon. And my first reaction was, oh, I want that as a t-shirt. <laughs> um, but I said, yeah, we'll have that. We'll have that. Yes, certainly. Yes. Because uh, you have to think about things like fonts. Before I yeah. started you know, bringing books out, I'd never thought about the font or the layout. Mm. And in each case, I've been quite lucky in who I've got to, to do. Um, and it gives you a bit of an input when you get involved in it. Now you all, the thing is about writing a book is that you have an idea, you write it and you rewrite it, keep visiting, and then you've got to start thinking, but I've got to think about the design, how do I want the tone of it, and then you've got to try to market it and sell it. And actually, I was warned that was the hardest, um, believe you me, it's the hardest side. But you, you wasn't very lucky with when you actually published the book, was you? Because it, 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 it came out, uh, the book came out the week that we went into the first national lockdown. So it was a bit like, whoa, book's out. Oh, hang on. You can't see anybody. You can't have an event. Um, so as yet, there hasn't there hasn't even been a launch of the knowledge. So it hasn't sold that many as yet? No, I'd, li I'd like to, to have sold an awful lot more. But I'll keep plugging away, a bit of social media, um, sending the book off. Um, and you've got to travel, hopefully. So one of the things that we both agreed on was that the book is very, very well researched. And a lot of people do things about cab trade. Um, they tend to get little details wrong that cab drivers pick up on. But yours is quite spot on. Oh, thank you. How did you manage to, did it take a long time for you to get that, that amount of detail? to get that amount of research to be able to, to put that into What I find with research is you end up having a load mm. and actually in some respects less is more. You need to have that breadth but then you cut it down yeah. because if you try to put it all in you, I think you're over flavouring like over flavouring the dish whereas if you pair it back a little bit and you think what are the small things that just kind of make it of the period yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, oh, I suppose with some of this stuff as well, the 70s is kind of, I'm a, I'm a child of the 70s, so although I was born in the 1960s, the 70s is quite formative, yeah. and I probably view it as slightly rose tinted glasses, but there are a lot of things that I view as iconic, and I tried to incorporate that of the period yeah. in with the cab stuff, because I, you know, I went to the London Transport Museum. I annoyed a lot of people by emailing them that are in the cab trade, had their websites, and I've had conversations with them. And they're incredibly supportive, particularly when you begin to talk a little bit about how things have changed and trying to work out when there was a divergence. And because it was set, it's set in the 1970s, also conscious that an awful lot of the roadways and the turning, that changes all the time in London. It's like a river changing course. So 
as a result, I had to think to myself, now I've got to be realistic here. It's going to be tough to get it completely right. And I wouldn't have done. But, right, one-way one -way systems came in at a certain time. Okay, so until that time, particular places would be logged down. Let's find out about what runs were being used. And then it was a little bit of fingers crossed because things, there might have been something that's happening in that particular year that was different. But you have to run with it because you can keep refining and as you refine it gets bigger and actually you want to pair it back. And I just want to, I wanted it really to have that wonderful flavour of the period. And I think it was, you know, there were, book, there were films that have influenced me in terms of like Get Carter, I suppose, and some of the late 60s, early 70s films. And I thought it has to have that kind of tone which says when it is. Because in fact, it's quite important to the storyline as well. So is that what made you set it in the 1970s? Because as you say, you're a child of the 70s. Is that what made you took, took your decision to set it in the 70s? I think it's part of the reason. Um, I also think that you know, I, I've written other books that are kind of fiction, but a few decades back. And I think also it's simpler because an awful lot of um, stuff that you read contemporary, it's very dominated by technology. Yeah. And um, you know the answer for the hero is found by keying it into his phone, or he goes onto his computer. I didn't want that because it's a, I suppose it's a little bit like um, the, the, the early James Bond films. I feel with the early ones, although they've changed back a little bit, is he has to sort it out himself. Yeah. He can't. He can't say, oh, you know. Although there's a little bit of that now, where the answer is supplied to you. Yeah. It all has to be done on the ground because that's how we all used to do it. If you think about it, you'd, you'd phone somebody from a phone box, a public phone box, to arrange you were going to meet them. Yep. This is where we're going to meet them. You kind of had to remember that that pub was open for those times. You couldn't check it on the phone. If if that all fell apart, your arrangements, well, you were left standing at the tube station. On your own. On your own. And you could have been there for three days. Yeah. Um, it was a completely different world. And actually, it involved a different way of thinking and planning. And that's that world. Yeah. So the storyline follows your main character. Mm -hmm. um, and he discovers there's this secret society. Mm -hmm. And um, just a little bit about the story and as to how it, he runs through this sort of secret society thing. Not too much. Not too much. <laughs> well, quite simply what happens is he has um, a regular customer. He probably has a couple, but this particular one that he picked up, and he probably shouldn't be having this arrangement rather than just stand there, but he does. He picks this fella up, and he arranges he's going to pick him up, and lo and behold, right in front of him, another cab cuts in, and there's something not right about it. The fare gets into the cab, and he gets cut up, and he's thinking something's not right, and then as it turns out, that's really a kind of harbouring of things to come. And also he has this sense of, he is the guardian of that fair. He, he has an obligation, not just to get him from A to B, he, it's his welfare. And the fact that this guy has now disappeared, it causes him concern and it's against his code. I think it's funny you should say that, because I think all cab drivers do it when you've got a passenger in the back. You feel you're responsible for them yeah. until you get into their destination. So it's quite you manage to get into a, a cab driver's headspace and yeah. and describe that in the book, which is it's really good. I think. Well, yeah. I think you know it's a commitment to the cabbie and it's a commitment to the to what the ethos of being a black cab driver is. Well, that's how I saw it, and having spoken to quite a few of them, they really put a big emphasis on it. Yeah, it, it's it's a public service. But yes, it, because it's a complex thing. It's also a business. But that ethos, you know, is strong, and it's probably what marks it out from some other services. Yeah, I mean, when we were talking, you described doing the knowledge, at least the book's called the knowledge, as um, the equivalent as a, as a PhD. And what makes you come to that conclusion? Obviously, your research has made you come to that sort of conclusion. I think I think it's that it's such a London is a huge city, and the the breadth of knowledge that every time I speak to a cabbie isn't the case of just the it's A to B. It's as you go along, they'll say to me, oh, that's so and so. And the history and sometimes the social context. And it might be stuff that you might have vaguely heard about in a history lesson at school or you've seen on a TV programme, but something, some little detail that you think, how the heck did you pick that up? But it's the range of it. And the amount of time it takes to do the knowledge, plus 
you're not in a situation where you know in, in the days gone by people went off to university to get grants now they you know get loans and they accumulate debt the you know, knowledge boys are working doing other stuff yeah. and they're out in the freezing cold in the wind and the rain with a clipboard and paper flapping about until they learn you put a rubber band or something around it and they they go around and it's you're doing one thing in order to aspirationally become something else to fulfill this role i've got huge admiration just for that let alone what the work entails later on so i just thought to myself it's the breadth of it it is a big undertaking and when you pass out you get that because i see it you know, on social media with um mr so-and-so Ah, big tip, well done, because that's a huge amount of effort. So when we did it, you didn't have that, you didn't have that, uh, the, the examiner present you with your badge yeah. and a nice certificate. All we got was you passed, go to the window and get your badge. Yeah, yeah. And it was like and 15, 15, 15 pence to buy your badge and you walked out and thought, well, that so, was a bit of an anti climax, wasn't it? And, yeah. uh, so we didn't have all that presentation thing. And yeah, I think stuff like modern that. world's it's probably modern. done that. Yeah. It's a bit like, um, you know, nurseries have graduations now. Mm. You know, kids nurseries they have it as a bigger, yeah. bigger thing. Everything was a bit more low key. In, in the book, Mark, you feature obviously the FX4 at the time mm. because that was the most prevalent cab on the streets. But you also feature an FX3 in there as well. Um, how did the other cab drivers sort of relate to the FX3 at the time? Because it would have been quite an old vehicle, and it was his dead cab or something in the book. Well, what what would it for me? Um, I like black and white films. They might have black and white cover, so yep. you can probably tell. So the the three, the FX three, featured in all these Ealing comedies. It featured in Ealing comedies. It features in um, just London and I suppose the war, yep. post war. And then I grew up really with the, uh, the FX four and just the, it's the curve of them. And, you know, they're, they're just graceful and they're so distinctive. And so what I thought was yeah. one of the things about Pinner is he comes from this tradition of cabs. Therefore, he would, in my feeling, he would love his cab, and particularly if it had a family connection. And so he lovingly has this cab, but there's a bit in it where there's only by this time only a couple left in London. Yeah. And uh, he is driving along one day and he sees one of the other, I think I say there's two or three left. And the guy, you know, Almost makes a nuisance yeah, of himself. So, look, I've got one like you. And, and Pinner, who's really proud of he's actually embarrassed. You know, because for him, it's a quiet thing because he's ribbed by the other cabins. Yeah. But not moving with the times. Like any and yet, at the same time, he senses that his co colleagues yeah. secretly admire him for it, for his homage to tradition and his honouring his, his father. Um, and he lo lovingly looks after it. You know, he's like yeah. toothbrush. Is he just and, you know, the, the accusation from his wife yeah. thing is that he's more interested, he looks after his cab better. Oh, yeah. than he does uh, than he does his family yeah. it's quite funny you should say that because I always used to buy an MKB for five years but there used to be a few cab drivers in London that had sort of old cabs you know like old FX cores and early fairways and they was keeping them on the road and they were absolutely spot it's probably as clean yeah. as, a, as the day it came out of the factory and, and you had to look on them in admiration you think you know, it must take a lot of work to keep it in that sort of condition. Yeah, it's, it's probably to, yeah, it's almost like the, you know, the, cabs, the cabbie and the cab are partners. So they kind of, if you're looking after the cab like that, they're equals. You know, they're not as much care on the cab as they look after themselves. Yeah, and I just love them. It's iconic. And also, I had a, um, at the time of putting it together, my, my stepson loved cabs. He's absolutely obsessed with them. So when he come, came to London, he, he wasn't interested in going to this toy shop or that toy shop. The main thing was having a trip in a cab. And the fact that you could climb into a cab and he never wanted to sit at the back, he wanted one of the fold, flat down yeah. seats. I so he was travelling backwards, travelling backwards yeah. in a cab. And, you know, that was the thing. And he went on and on about it. So getting to the, the end of the book, Mark, you've uh, you sort of left it open, haven't you, as to so there could be possibly a sequel there? Yes, I decided to do that. It was probably always going to be the plan. Um, and I've done some notes on a, on a possible sequel. And I'm still having a bit of a debate. I mean, bear in mind the knowledge from the you know, first idea, early 1990s, to finally not coming out until about 20 years later. Now, how long would it take for the seed to germinate? I don't know. But um, yeah, I've got a little bit in mind about how it would progress. Um, 
but I'm not that quick at the writing, so it'll take me a little while yet. Um, and I tend to find I'm guilty of being a bit of a magpie, um, where I'm jumping, you know, I've got a different project planned for next year, and they they're not usually all that related. Um, and then I'll kind of come around in a circle and think, oh, I've left this one for too long. So I have got a plan, um, just don't ask me to put a time scale on it. What a great interview with Mark Jackson there. Now, if you want a copy of the book, The Knowledge, we're gonna put a link down below where you can get a copy sent direct to you at home. I'd like to thank Mark for taking the time to speak to us at Company Cabbies, and also to Andor at the Temple Shelter for allowing us to use the shelter to do the interview in. All I can say is get behind it and support the book it's great it is a great book we're not earning anything out of it we just think it's a great book and that's why we think you should buy it also support andor at the temple shelter as well because these shelters are not being used by that many cab drivers and you really do need to support those who support the trade until next time like and subscribe the video and see you again soon thanks very much What?